Milton this conference Humane. will now be recorded. The Oakville and Milton Humane Society has been extremely fortunate that Dr. Baird has been volunteering her time to provide veterinary care to the shelter animals since 2013. Over the years, she has helped hundreds of animals and we are grateful to have her medical experience. Dr. Baird enjoys all facets of veterinary medicine and takes a special interest in dentistry, nutrition, and soft tissue surgery. She loves helping to educate pet owners so that their pets live better, longer lives. Dr. Baird's animal family includes a dog and two cats, and both cats were actually adopted through volunteering at the OMHS. So I would like to give a very warm welcome to our guest speaker, Dr. Baird, and just give me a moment while I will transfer over to her. Just a moment, please. Just have to find her. There we go. And I will make her our presenter. Over to you, Dr. Baird. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Heather. Uh, and thank you, everyone, uh, for joining us tonight. Uh, as Heather mentioned, we're going to go through some um, things about some first aid for your pets. Um, and included in that first aid, we're going to talk about um, some illnesses, things that you can watch for in your pets, things that you can um, you know, sometimes deal with at home, um, sometimes, you know, get a little bit ahead of it before you have to seek veterinary care. And then we'll talk about some of the things that we need to do uh, specifically, uh, or sorry, things that you need to specifically get your pet immediately to your veterinarian. So, so first we're gonna talk a little bit about um, what is first aid. Um, I'm sorry, I just need to get this out of my screen here. Oh. And we're jumping ahead here. There we go. Okay, so first aid is, um, generally speaking, the provision of initial care for an illness or an injury until appropriate medical treatment can be accessed. So certain Simple injuries, um, simple self-limiting illnesses can sometimes be dealt with and may not require any further medical care past that initial bit of first aid that you might apply. But other situations require first aid simply as a stopgap measure. So something to temporarily alleviate suffering or to prevent further deterioration of the situation until the appropriate medical help can be sought. So. We're going to talk about some of these situations tonight and how you can maybe differentiate between these types of things and, and what you can do to help. So I, I want to start first off by saying always in this situation, you have to consider safety. So before administering any type of first aid, it's important to properly assess the situation for danger to both yourself and others. It's really important to remember that injured animals can and will bite. This is a natural reaction to a painful situation um, and appropriate precautions need to be taken. So this applies to your own pet uh, as well as you know any animals that you might come upon and obviously to any wildlife, which I will not recommend you doing any of these first aid things that we talk about tonight to any wildlife. Um, but we just need to remember that in these stressful situations, biting is always possible. So uh, consider using a muzzle or if that's not available, a thick towel or blanket uh, to be used before any kind of handling or lifting. So you'll see throughout the presentation tonight, I'm going to have a few things highlighted in red. Those are just to um, highlight things that you might want to consider having in a bit of a first aid kit at home. And I'm gonna go over um, um, a, a list of things that you can have in a first aid kit at the end of the presentation, but I'm just highlighting them as we go so that when we're talking about specific situations, you can see where these, these particular items might be applied. Thank <laughs> you. 
Um, and then before we get into some of the situations in which you might be able to intervene and help, I just want to point out a few situations where you really want to consider just going to a veterinarian immediately without after actually intervening. These are either things that are serious enough that we don't have time to wait and, and provide any at-home care, um, situations where there's not much that you can actually do at home, and then situations where um, uh, you might be putting yourself into an even more dangerous situation. So uh, one of these things, going to the vet basically immediately without intervention is toxicity. And we're going to talk more in detail about some specific toxicities and toxins uh, and, and um, what we can do to help them. Uh, but definitely, this is one where you really want to get to your veterinarian immediately. Difficulty breathing and choking. Um, choking is always a... a a tough one. Uh, I see a lot of animals that um, owners are thinking are choking or have something caught in their throat and they are really exhibiting maybe signs of kennel cough or some other type of cough that's that's happening that has nothing to do with something being caught in the throat. You have to remember if there is something truly caught in your animal's throat and by throat we mean the trachea so the tube carrying uh, air down into the lungs, your pet is not going to be able to breathe. So if they are, you know, doing some coughing but going about daily activities and they're they're breathing normally, there's not something caught in that trachea. When we're talking about things caught in, say, the esophagus, which is what carries food down into our stomach, if you feed your pet a treat, they can take that and swallow it without issue. There's not something caught in their throat. So I just want to be sure to, to help you guys to differentiate when an animal is truly choking and when they might just be exhibiting signs of a cough. We also have to remember if a dog is truly choking, you want to be very careful both for yourself and that animal to not attempt to intervene unless absolutely necessary. So if you truly think that your pet is choking and you feel it's safe to open their mouth out, up and look in the back of the throat, you can do so. If an object is not immediately visible to you, don't go digging your finger around in the back of the throat. Number one, you could do a lot more damage in terms of um, you know, scratching some pretty delicate tissues back there. You could also potentially push that object farther down into the airway. And um, being bitten in these situations is a very real thing. And I have seen owners attempt to intervene, feeling that their pet is choking when they weren't and been bitten very badly in the process. And you have to understand that an animal that is truly having difficulty breathing is very panicked. And again, that natural response is to bite. So I really want um, want everybody to be aware of that and be really careful trying to intervene. Um, there are, um, again, in true choking situations, there are ways to perform a Heimlich maneuver in animals, and it's very similar to how it's done in people. The Heimlich maneuver uh, applies pressure to the uh, upper abdomen and in doing so in the chest to try to expel whatever may be caught in the airway. And that is something that um, you can attempt. Um, and you can definitely, you know, look some uh, YouTube videos up on that. Uh, but again, that situation doesn't present itself as often as you would think. And I would really like people to attempt to get their animal to a veterinarian as quickly as possible. Uh, another situation is collapse um, or what appears to be fainting. There's not a lot that can be done at home in this situation, and these situations are generally um, very serious in nature, so I would recommend you get these animals to your veterinarian quickly. Um, I mentioned this next one, so this is for cats specifically. Uh, straining in the litter box without urine production. That is always um, an immediate and life-threatening um, issue. And again, nothing that can be dealt with at home. Again, we often get phone calls um, at the clinic for um, you know, someone thinking that their pet is straining to have a bowel movement. And 
nine times out of 10 in a cat, especially in a male cat, that's going to be uh, straining in an attempt to urinate. And that is a, a very serious condition. And I would like to recommend people get their pet to a veterinarian quite, uh, quite quickly with that. Um, uh, burns, so anything that, that happens, um, you know, boiling water, obviously fire and hot objects. Again, not something you want to address at home. Burns are something that in the initial period can look like they're not something overly serious and without intervention can progress, you know, to a pretty advanced, um, advanced condition. So I would say burns, don't mess around with them yourself and, and really try to get them into your veterinarian for, for appropriate treatment quickly. And then I have seizure with a question mark here. So uh, a seizure, a generalized seizure, your pet will be um, unconscious for a period of time. That can be a matter of seconds um, and it can be, you know, up to a minute or several minutes. I can tell you if you're watching your your pet have a seizure, um, that's always going to seem like a long period of time. And even if it lasts 15 or 20 seconds, it will feel like an eternity. Uh, the reason I have a question mark beside that is if your pet has a single seizure, comes out of it relatively quickly, recovers back to normal um, relatively quickly, and doesn't have another one in the immediate period, it may not be something that you absolutely need to rush to an emergency clinic out of hours or rush to your veterinarian immediately. Um, and it may be something that you can call your veterinarian and ask for advice on how to deal with that. The reason I have a question mark is if your pet is experiencing multiple seizures in a row or even, you know, more than one in a, um, you know, 12 or 24 hour period, then that is something you probably should take them in for quickly. Um, that generally does indicate something a little bit more serious. The more seizures your pet is allowed to have, then that generally creates more seizures. So if it is happening more frequently, we do want to intervene with that pretty quickly. So getting them into your veterinarian or, or as I said, to an emergency clinic after hours is pretty important. So we're going to talk a little bit about toxicities. Um, toxicities will, well, I'll go through a few things that are, are the more common toxicities that we see um, around the house. I will say it, it tends to be more dogs than cats. Um, dogs tend to eat more ridiculous things than cats do. Cats tend to be a little bit more intelligent when it comes to, to ingesting things, especially things that don't taste good around the house. Um, but uh, definitely can happen to either species. Uh, I, I want to, again, really point out a toxicity is very time sensitive. Always something you should take your pet into a veterinarian as quickly as possible if you know that they have ingested something toxic. The sooner you get to your veterinarian, the sooner we can induce vomiting and hopefully potentially uh, reduce the effects of that toxin. So the longer it is able to stay in the system, the more is absorbed and the less we can do without longer medical care. There are a lot of toxins. If your pet ingests and we can get to them in a very quick period of time, once we induce vomiting, they can go right home and we don't have any lasting effects. So definitely waiting is not um, in your pet's best interests. And if you're unsure, always call your veterinarian and they're happy to advise you on whether they think that you need to come in uh, sooner rather than later. I will point out, you will see lots of things online about inducing vomiting at home. Generally, that's recommended with using hydrogen peroxide because it's something people often have at home. Um, it's something easily accessible at your uh, local pharmacy. But it is very, very rarely something I do not recommend. Sorry, very, very rarely something that I recommend. There is a lot of risk of creating some ulceration in the stomach um, or seriously irritating the stomach lining, which often requires longer treatment than might have been necessary uh, if we could induce vomiting ourselves at the clinic. Um, 
unless you're in an extremely remote area and unable to access um, any veterinary care in any kind of timely manner, uh, I, it's just not something that I recommend. So I, we have such safe methods to be able to induce vomiting um, at any veterinary hospital that I would really recommend you take them somewhere if you can. So some common things that we see um, animals ingest and, and have issues with, um, antifreeze. Antifreeze has a really sweet taste. So if it does happen to be spilled in an area leaking from somewhere, um, animals will go and lick that up because of its sweet taste. Um, rat poison or mouse poison, obviously those things are designed um, to be uh, palatable and ingested by animals. That's their whole um, way of working. And so um, definitely if your pet has ingested uh, rat or mouse poison, they should be seen quickly to induce vomiting. Um, these um, these products are made to cause clotting issues and cause internal bleeding. And if, if we don't get to them in time, um, there will be internal bleeding and we're looking at blood transfusions and, and much more significant treatment. So definitely you want to get them in quickly for that. Um, human medications, obviously there are some things that are more benign than others uh, and some that might seem very simple like ibuprofen say that people take very readily and very commonly but that are very toxic to um, to dogs in particular so again when you're not sure call your veterinarian they're always very happy to let you know what is something that you need to be worried about and what isn't um, and again the longer it's in the body the more that can be ingested so getting that out quickly is is very important um, xylitol is something that a lot of people don't know about. It is an artificial sweetener that's in a lot of products, um, a lot of yogurts, um, sugar-free gum, it's very common in. Um, you know, I've had some puddings and things like that that have it in. So anything that does contain an artificial sweetener that your uh, dog or cat, uh, and, and again, it's dogs generally that ingest, that ingest that and it is dogs that it is toxic to. Uh, but they really require very small amounts in order to have um, um, pretty deleterious effects. So um, any ingestion of um, that requires some intervention. Uh, lily ingestion, um, and that, that pertains to cats. Cats obviously like to eat plants around the house. Lilies are a really popular flower um, in a lot of flower arrangements. And unfortunately, something that not a lot of people are aware that, that cats have um, a, a very severe reaction to and even just licking petals um, licking that orange or yellow powder that happens in the center of the plant um, or even just a couple of bites without actually eating the leaves and and a cat can go into uh, sometimes irreversible kidney failure so definitely something that if it, if you're just not sure if your cat has had contact with lilies that are around really a trip to your veterinarian is in order uh, grapes and raisins, uh, again, that pertains to dogs, uh, and dogs have, honestly, a sensitivity that we don't fully understand. Um, grapes and raisins is uh, often an individual uh, toxicity, so not every dog will actually have a sensitivity to it. I have lots of clients that will say to me, that that's strange, I've, you know, fed my dogs all his, uh, fed my dog all his life grapes, or I had a dog as a kid who always ate grapes. And you know what, that dog probably didn't have that issue that they were um, um, susceptible to this toxicity, but there's no way of knowing what dog is susceptible. And unfortunately, it is something that's not dose dependent. So for a dog that is particularly susceptible, even just eating a few grapes could cause a problem. Again, this is a renal failure issue. So Best to keep your uh, pets away um, from any um, grapes, raisins, that includes baked goods, and, um, and if you're afraid that they've ingested it, then certainly take them in for vomiting. And then the one everybody knows, uh, chocolate. Um, one thing I will point out, chocolate is quite dose dependent. Um, so unlike grapes and raisins um, that, again, even a large dog, a few grapes could be very harmful. Um, chocolate is quite dose dependent. So what that means is 
Milk chocolate is um, much less serious than dark chocolate, which is much less serious than um, straight cocoa powder. And um, small dogs are more susceptible because of their small body mass versus a large dog. So uh, calling your veterinarian is really helpful in this because we have lots of tools that can help us to calculate what is going to be a, a harmful amount. And they can have anything from, if it's a small amount, they can just have some vomiting and diarrhea, but it can be fatal. So always something to check out. Um, and again, getting involved quicker um, is, is always important. So I'll just mention under this category, um, even though that's not truly a toxicity, but foreign objects. So that's like your dog eating, um, you know, socks and, and um, um, you know, part of their toy or part of a bed or things around the house. Um, it's amazing sometimes the, um, you know, size of an object, something can be quite small and we might feel like it's going to pass and, and I've had to go in and surgically remove those things. Um, your, your gastrointestinal tract does narrow as it moves along. And so something that might pass out of the stomach and into the first part of your small intestine doesn't necessarily flow through that entire small intestine. And, you know, the last thing that anyone wants to do is, is go in and, and remove a foreign object from a dog that was something potentially preventable. Um, if you know your dog's eaten a sock and you know what happened within the last, you know, half hour to two hours, call your veterinarian. Oftentimes we can induce vomiting and bring those things up provided they haven't moved too far in the gastrointestinal system. Things tend to stay in the stomach for, for, you know, can be up to several hours. And so um, it's so much easier and obviously so much less expensive for you and so much less invasive for your pet to have them come in, induce vomiting and get that up rather than waiting to see if it passes and, uh, and worried about uh, um, going and getting that out. So we'll talk a little bit about... Um, you know, some of these these first aid things that you can deal with at home and, and how to differentiate maybe something that's possible for you to deal with on your own or um, something that really does need to be seen. Um, I am gonna show a few pictures of some of these um, wounds. So uh, I, I'll, warn, I'll warn you before I'm moving to those slides. So if you are somebody who's a little squeamish something, seeing some of this stuff and I promise it's not too, uh, not too grotesque, but um, I'll show you so that you can kind of appreciate the difference between some of these wounds. So we'll start with the simple wounds and scratches. So a minor scratch or scrape that includes just the superficial skin. I often point out to people uh, when they bring their own dogs or cats in for, for a wound or a scratch and they're not sure if it's something that I should look at. You know, think of it in terms of yourself. And if this is something you feel you would see your own physician for, uh, by all means, your pet should come in. But if you feel this is something that if it happened to you, would you be comfortable just dealing with it um, on your own? Then it's likely something that can be uh, dealt with at home for your pet. So, you know, a nice gentle cleaning um, and an antibiotic cream. Again, I have that highlighted because that's going to be something that's great for your, um, your uh, first aid kit would be really helpful. Uh, pets do love to lick off ointments and creams that you put onto them. So generally for dogs, I'll recommend pop that on and um, take them out for a walk for 10 or 15 minutes. Um, that's enough distraction for them that that's going to have some time to soak in. And by the time they get home, if they lick it off, not such a big deal because it's probably already done enough of its job for you. For cats, find a toy that they really like um, and distract them with that. Uh, maybe do it right before you feed them or feed them some canned food if they're, you know, they get really focused on that and eat it. Anything to keep them away, as I said, for 10 or 15 minutes. So I think I have a picture. Of, yeah, so that's just a very superficial skin wound that likely doesn't require any, um, any intervention by, by a veterinarian. So the next one would be a laceration. So a laceration is a wound that's produced by um, um, tearing the tissue or the skin. So um, it's often contaminated and will likely require some further treatment. So this is an example 
Um, sorry, I'm just gonna try to move this out of the way here because I just realized this is gonna be showing up for you guys. Okay, uh, so this is an example of some lacerations here. So you can see that's full thickness through the skin. You can see muscle underlying there. And so um, that's something that's likely going to require more care than you can you know, provide at home. Um, sorry, I'm having trouble going back here. So a laceration um, will likely require further treatment, as I said. A puncture, kind of similar to a laceration, but will look a little bit different. It's generally a wound that's caused by a sharp pointy object, so something like a nail or a tooth. Because of the nature of how that goes into the tissue, they often don't um, bleed excessively. And when you go and look at it, it, it may look like it's just going to close up on its own. However, because they do often penetrate deep into the tissue, they do often get contaminated and they will likely need uh, further examination and treatment from your veterinarian. So I'll show you a picture of a puncture. Again, it's not going to look like much uh, because it usually just kind of closes itself up. So you can see that looks like a really minor wound, but because something is penetrated deep into those tissues, it's worth your veterinarian having a look at and see if it needs further. Uh, further help. So when we're talking about bite wounds, or sorry, uh, puncture wounds, I do want to talk a little bit about bite wounds. Um, dogs and cats, they, they have very different um, effects of their bite wounds, different ways that they present themselves, um, but they do both really need to be dealt with by a veterinarian. So dog bites will often initially look a lot less concerning than they are. So, you know, again, because they are a puncture, that tooth goes in, and then oftentimes it scabs over or closes over quickly, and it looks like it's healed. But we have to remember, dog teeth and jaws are really powerful, and they can cause a ton of damage to soft tissue. So when I talk about these kinds of dog bites, I don't mean, you know, if you have two friendly dogs who are wrestling and playing, that's unlikely, even if there was a little nick in the skin, unlikely to cause a lot of problem. But when you're talking about two dogs that into an, get into an altercation in the dog park, even if it looks like something that's really brief, it really is something that warrants having your veterinarian have a look at. Um, if you think about if a dog gets bit uh, somewhere over its body, so over the chest, over the abdomen, it's really easy for a large canine tooth, that's those big fangs, to penetrate into the chest or into the abdomen and you can't even tell yourself that that's happened because again, that's deep into the tissue and not necessarily something that you can uh, visualize. And the secondary effects of that won't necessarily be immediately obvious. So having your, um, your dog evaluated at your veterinarian, they can tell you whether they feel like, you know, we really should be doing some further workup, like some x-rays to look if this has actually um, entered into one of these body cavities to see if more, um, more care is warranted. And I would say this is especially important for little dogs that are bit by bigger dogs. Um, you know, that there's, there's a, a common phenomenon known as big dog, little dog that these are exactly these type, types of wounds that happen. A big dog it may appear quick, they pick that dog up, and the owner takes them home and the, the little guy does fine for you know a period of time and that night decompensates because you know they've had a penetrating wound into the chest and now they're having difficulty breathing. So always something that should be looked at. And the other thing that can happen aside from just penetrating wounds into that chest or abdomen, um, dogs often when they're fighting or when they bite, they grab and pull. And what that does is, is it separates the skin from the underlying muscle and it creates this big pocket. Mouths are dirty. People's mouths are dirty. Animals' mouths are dirty. There's lots of bacteria carried in there. Our mouths can handle that. It's made for that environment. That bacteria is not meant to live under the skin, especially when a scab is going to close over that, trap that bacteria in there. And that's where we get a lot of um, 
uh, a lot of infection and, and potentially abscesses. So definitely something we want to deal with. You're better to prophylactically put your, your dog onto antibiotics rather than waiting until a bigger wound ensues. Uh, we often then have to remove large areas of skin and tissue and it, it's just a much longer healing process. Cat bites, um, on the other hand, they're a whole different phenomenon on themselves. Cat uh, mouths, uh, all cats carry a bacteria called Pastorella maltosida um, in their mouths. That's normal for them. Again, their mouths handle that no problem, and that's not an issue in that area. But when they introduce that into the skin, uh, that's where you get that term cat bite abscesses, and it really commonly happens. So uh, abscess formation is highly likely, if not, I mean, a definite um, sequelae to having, a, having been bit by a cat. It often occurs five to, five to seven days after the initial bite wound. I have a lot of patients come in. It's an outdoor cat. Owners aren't even aware that they got into a fight. It was a tiny little penetrating wound that healed itself over, and they didn't even notice that it was there. Five to seven days later, that cat comes in now has a huge fever, isn't eating, seems really painful, and I'll often find a cat bite abscess. When I shave that cat up, I find that little um, puncture wound that had caused this. So again, so much quicker and easier to deal with that. If you notice that wound on your cat, you know your cat's gonna develop an abscess. So get them into your veterinarian um, preemptively, and it's gonna be a much easier issue to deal with. Um, and again, these, these wounds are easily, easily missed, especially if they're in a haired area. So if you do happen to have a cat that goes outdoors, um, outside of your yard, which I don't recommend, by the way, they should always be confined in your yard, just like a dog. But if you do have a cat that goes out, um, I would get in the habit of regularly checking them when they come in for any signs of, of any little puncture or bite wounds. So a torn nail, um, that, this is a pretty common injury in dogs, a um, little less frequent in cats, but it certainly does happen. Um, a torn nail or a nail fracture um, is something that uh, happens, it's, it can happen where the nail breaks kind of midway, it can um, break way, way high up at the base near the toe, or sometimes it just involves that nail being lifted right off the quick. So that's the live part of the nail. That's where the blood supply is and, and where the nerve is. It happens for various reasons. Um, sometimes, you know, dog's nails are just left too long and, and they are much more susceptible to fracturing that way. Um, I find uh, summertime, we see a lot of them from things like um, deck boards. You know, your dog's kind of running across the deck catches it in that little space between your deck boards and the nail tears that way. We'll often see them in the winter um, due to dogs running along like ice that, that uh, kind of breaks and the nail catches on. Um, so it, again, it's a pretty common injury. They are really painful. Um, you know, they do tend to bleed a lot. And so, you know, usually what happens is owners see the bleeding and then the dogs are licking at them like crazy and they're licking because of the bleeding and also because they are really painful. Because of that pain, if you're going to attempt to deal with this nail at all, I would recommend that you place the muzzle um, before you handle it. Um, dogs in general don't love having their feet touched. Um, that's not uncommon, but again, like we talked about earlier, when they are so painful, um, Biting is always a possibility. That's just their way of letting you know, please don't touch that anymore. Um, and so you're very safe to place a muzzle uh, when you're going to deal with that. And so they do often bleed a lot. You can apply some pressure with a gauze or a small towel. And if the bleeding continues, you can apply very gently um, some styptic powder to the area. Styptic powder is something you can get at most pet stores, you can get at your veterinarian, um, and it's something that helps to cauterize the, the vessels that are causing that bleeding. Um, it's not a long-term solution, but it can help to stop that bleeding in the, in the interim. Um, styptic powder doesn't tend to work when an area is really saturated with blood, so I would recommend if you're gonna use it, use that gauze, use that towel, get some of that blood away, and then you can pack some of that powder on to try to stop that bleeding. In terms of removing that uh, fragment or that piece of nail that's fractured off, 
I'd really recommend you leave that um, that procedure to your veterinarian. That's generally done under sedation because they are so painful. Um, and um, again, there's usually going to be further care needed. So removing it doesn't really help that process at all. It's something your veterinarian is going to do anyway. So we'll move on to um, allergic reactions. Um, this is a pretty common thing that we see um, in both dogs and cats. Uh, they're generally caused by an insect bite or sting. Um, again, I'll generally say this is more of a dog thing than a cat thing. Dogs, again, way more um, inclined to go biting at a bee that's, you know, coming around them than a cat is. And so we do typically see it a little more commonly in dogs, um, but it can also be due to reaction to medications, uh, vaccines, chemicals, I mean, virtually anything. So clinical signs might involve a swollen face or a muzzle, and I'll show you some pictures of that. Um, uh, hives or wheels, again, I'll show you a picture of that. Uh, and then, you know, intense itching, uh, I will differentiate that a little bit from, um, you know, seasonal allergies and food allergies. When I talk about this type of itching, it's something that comes up very suddenly. Uh, again, usually because it's it's due to just an acute reaction to contact with something. So that intense itch itching. And then if it gets bad enough, sometimes drooling, vomiting, diarrhea. Uh, so if you see, you know, your dog has a swollen face or hives, uh, and you know that maybe you saw them got, get stung by a bee, maybe you saw them snapping or, or biting at a bee, uh, and you do think that this is what it is, you can always try a dose of Benadryl. But ultimately, I would contact your veterinarian um, and, and just see what they think about for the next steps. If all we're dealing with is a swollen face and they respond well to Benadryl, your veterinarian might just say, you know what, stay at home and monitor them and, um, and you can you know, give Benadryl for the next 24 hours or so. I would recommend that if you're gonna carry some Benadryl in your first aid kit, call your, your, um, your dog's veterinarian and ask to, for them to give you an appropriate dosage of Benadryl for your dog ahead of time so that you have it in case of emergency. Um, doses uh, for dogs and cats for all medications do not equate in any way to um, humans. So, you know, it's not a matter of you can say, well, as an adult, I would take one tablet. So my dog's about half my size. I'll give them half a tablet. Dose ranges are very, very different for different species. So for that reason, I would recommend you contact your, your um, dog's vet to, to get an appropriate dose of Benadryl just based on their body weight. So these are just a couple of pictures of those um, things that I talked about. Obviously the two on the top are that swollen um, face um, that the boxer on the right there, his eyes are really swollen shut. Uh, that's pretty common when we see these insect stings. And then the two dogs on the bottom, um, and, and again, those look like boxer type dogs. Unfortunately, um, boxers are really prone to these uh, these allergic type reactions and those are pictures of hives or wheels on them there so when you see those little bits it look, almost looks like just circles of raised fur all over the body that's hives and that's something that will very likely respond pretty well to benadryl if these reactions get serious enough we do sometimes need more things than just benadryl um, oftentimes corticosteroids are needed um, and that's not something you can just hang on to at home and have and that's the reason i would recommend you you know call your your vet once you've given this dose or when you see this reaction to see if they recommend you come in. Heat stroke is a really um, serious condition um, that obviously this time of year we, we unfortunately do see. Um, so unlike humans, dogs can't sweat. They don't have sweat glands in their skin like we do. Uh, and so that's where panting comes in. Panting does help to lower their body temperature. They do have some minor um, sweat glands in their feet, but that's a really small um, surface area on their body. So they really don't eliminate a significant amount of heat from there. They do rely on panting. So when dogs are exposed to very high environmental temperatures for too long, so obviously that's an extremely hot day without relief, um, being out in the sun without access to shade, 
obviously being locked in a hot car uh, for any period of time. So when they're exposed to those high temperatures and panting isn't enough to reduce the body temperature, then heat stroke occurs. Heat stroke is very serious. So um, we, um, again, I, I have a little bit here on the, the most common signs of heat stroke. So that excessive panting, all dogs are gonna pant on a hot day, but I mean that excessive panting where that tongue is hanging out, they really don't seem like they can relax and it, it's a really harsh sound. Other signs will include drooling, um, reddened gums, you know, your dog's gums should look nice and pink, but when they're looking that dark red, almost purpley colored, that is definitely cause for concern. Uh, it can progress to vomiting and diarrhea, um, mental dullness and um, uncoordinated movement. So if they're really looking almost like they're drunk, um, you know, stumbling around and don't seem to know what's going on around them, and then, you know, can progress to collapse. From there, we can get brain swelling, um, blood clotting issues, which can lead to some gastrointestinal bleeding, sloughing of that uh, stomach lining, kidney failure. Uh, so anytime you are concerned about um, heat stroke in your dog, uh, veterinary attention is always warranted. There are definitely uh, some dogs that are more prone to uh, developing heat stroke. Brachycephalic dogs are definitely those dogs. So by brachycephalic, any of your squishy faced dogs. So um, pugs, English bulldogs, French bulldogs, boxers, they are dogs uh, because of pre-existing breathing issues really are um, at an extra um, cause of concern for developing heat stroke. We have to be so careful about those dogs on hot days and they really need to have a lot of access to um, cooler areas, shade, water, um, even submersing in water, all of those things to try to prevent this. So as I said, if you're concerned about heat stroke, your dog really does need to be seen immediately. But while you're traveling to the nearest veterinary clinic, there are some things that you can do. Um, so obviously you've already removed them from that hot setting. You wanna drive with the windows open, get some wind in the car, blast that air conditioning on high and try to keep them close to those vents. You can take some towels soaked with cool water. Best places to put them along his back, along his belly, around his chest. Um, and that's just because those are large surface areas. So we're trying to contact as much of that body as possible. Allow, if they're willing, allow your dog to drink as much cool water as possible. So don't force them to drink. Obviously, if we're getting into that uncoordinated drunk look, that's not something I want you to force them to drink. Uh, but if they are willing and able, definitely have them drink a lot of cool water. You can also try dousing the food, uh, the foot pads with alcohol. So again, that's something you can have in your first aid kit. Um, that evaporation of the alcohol in an area where they do have some uh, ability to sweat can help to decrease their body temperature. It's definitely not enough. Um, definitely that's such a small surface area that uh, we do need more intervention. But again, this is something that can help while you're, while you're en route to getting more help. So I will just talk a little bit about, um, these aren't first aid things, but some illnesses and medical conditions really commonly experienced by pet owners that, um, you know, we'll talk a little bit about what you can do to determine if your um, pet needs to be seen or whether it's something you can deal with at home. So vomiting and diarrhea, super, super common. Um, the urgency with which you should seek care in this situation really depends on the duration, how long it's been going on for. If your dog or cat has vomited once, probably not something that they need to be seen immediately. If they've vomited six times over, you know, the period of a morning, something you should consider taking them in. So the frequency that that's happening, and then the overall demeanor of your pet. I'm sure if some of you have called your veterinarian and said, you know, my dog's vomiting, should he come in today? First question they probably ask is, how's he acting? Is he bright and alert and his normal self? Then probably something we can monitor for another 24 hours or so. Generally speaking, I will say um, withhold food until you're able to access care. The reason I kind of have that 
soft generally is obviously if you I don't want you withholding food for several days um, that's especially important in cats that can create some further problems um, but seeking some guidance from your veterinarian they're always happy to provide some advice on whether or not your pet needs to come in and whether or not you should withhold food but generally if your dog or cat is having vomiting or diarrhea you're often just fueling the fire by continuing to feed them. So withholding food for the short term might be a good idea. Uh, hot spots is also a common thing that we see in animals. Um, if you have a golden retriever, you're probably pretty, uh, pretty um, familiar with this situation. So hot spots are inflamed or infected skin lesions and they look like a wet scab. They look wet because they're generally oozing. So they're really common, again, in this weather during warm, humid months or in dogs that swim a lot. They swim, they're constantly staying wet, that moisture traps against the skin and we get some lesions there. I often hear owners say, I swear to God, this was not there yesterday and they seem like they come up overnight and they often do and they're made worse by the licking, scratching and chewing that the animal's doing because it's so irritated. Uh, and common spots that they occur are on the head, neck, limbs, hips, um, really they can occur anywhere, but we often see it up in, in the um, head and neck and under the ears, uh, for uh, especially for golden retrievers and labs. Um, they generally do, do uh, require some medical intervention. They're infected, they do require antibiotics, they often require a shaving to get that fur off so that they, the area can breathe. So I do recommend you, you see your uh, veterinarian. Um, bloat or GDV, uh, GDV is gastric dilation volvulus. Basically what this means is the uh, stomach flips on itself and when it does that it cuts off your, um, um, not only the blood supply but everything moving in and out of the stomach. Uh, that is a true emergency. Uh, it most commonly occurs in deep chested dogs. So if you think German Shepherds, Great Danes, Standard Poodles, those dogs that have that really um, thick, long chest. And signs that you wanna watch for in that is non-productive vomiting or retching. So what that means is dogs that are, uh, they look like they're trying to vomit and nothing is coming up. If you can imagine that stomach is flipped over on itself, so there's no way any stomach contents are coming out. So if you see your dog, um, especially one of those deep chested breeds, looking really uncomfortable, trying to vomit and nothing is happening, care should be sought immediately. Um, affected dogs will also often, they'll stand and stretch. Uh, I think what they're trying to do is alleviate some of that pressure that's happening in their abdomen and they'll often drool excessively. And then lameness. Lameness is obviously a common condition we see in, in dogs and cats. So by lameness, I mean any kind of limping or non-weight bearing, so holding that limb right up in the air. Uh, it can be caused by a variety of issues from soft tissue, uh, soft tissue problems. Um, so that's like muscle, ligament, uh, tendon to bone issues. And sometimes neurological issues will kind of come into play there. In most cases, you know, if your dog is otherwise acting normal, uh, it may be reasonable to monitor them for, to rest and monitor them for 24 to 48 hours before seeking veterinary attention. Um, I do recommend that rest. I think that's a really important part of the, the um, solution. So, you know, maybe short little walks or just out to use the washroom, but otherwise no running, playing, especially no chasing balls, things like that, um, to see if it's something that resolves itself. So I talked throughout this about things that you might want to include in your first aid kit. Um, some of these I kind of touched on, some I didn't. Um, but things like saline eye flush, um, that's obviously something that, you know, if you're concerned about something being in your dog's eye, uh, it's never harmful to squirt some saline in there and try to get it out. Uh, saline is much kinder to the eye, much more comfortable than water. Tweezers. Tweezers are, are great to use for little things like thorns and slivers and things like that. A cold pack, so one of those, um, you can get them at the pharmacy where they can just sit in your first aid kit and you can crush them and they turn into a, a cold pack, obviously for um, some, some uh, injuries. 
uh, a muzzle like we talked about. And I'm gonna just show you, uh, the last slide is just showing you some pictures of some muzzles, just so you know what I'm talking about. Alcohol uh, obviously can be used for wounds and cuts, but also like we talked about for heat stroke. A digital thermometer. So I do recommend digital. I don't think a lot of people use the mercury glass thermometers anymore, but never a great idea in a dog that might, a dog or cat that might be thrashing around. Um, you know, there's no harm in a digital thermometer dropping. They also tend to uh, get you a uh, temperature a little bit quicker, which is always helpful. That styptic powder that we talked about to help with um, bleeding nails. Um, if you like to do your own dog's nails at home uh, or your own cat's nails at home, that styptic powder can come in handy too in case you trim one just a little bit short. The triple antibiotic ointment, so something like polysporin is helpful. Benadryl, like we talked about. Um, gauze, uh, telpha pads, and then something called vet wrap, although you can get it in a human pharmacy. All that is is a bandage material that sticks to itself. So when you're wrapping it around, it doesn't stick to the skin, it doesn't stick to wounds, but it can help to cover things up. Telpha pads are um, a little um, bandage material that won't stick to your wound when, when applied to, like, say, a moist or open wound. And then make sure that you always on, have on hand a list of local veterinary clinics and emergency clinics. So the reason I recommend that is for people who are maybe hiking out of their area, camping up at cottages, uh, very, very um, uh, important to have those things on hand. So these are just a few of the muzzles that I mentioned. Um, they're obviously a material muzzle and then some people prefer the basket muzzles. That one with that little French bulldog there, um, those little, again, those brachycephalic dogs, they don't have a muzzle for the nose to go over. So they do really require a special muzzle and these um, uh, brachycephalic dogs can uh, benefit from the use of one of these. And then a cat muzzle, if you have a cat at home. So if I can figure this out appropriately, we're going to go to the question part. So if you have any questions, please put this in the chat, put them in the chat. Uh, and I will read them out and go over things. Okay. Okay. So great for raisin toxicity, would that include prunes and currants? Uh, no, it doesn't. Um, you know, obviously you want to be very certain that those are the correct ingredients that you're dealing with and that there aren't also some raisins hidden in there. But generally, no, those are not um, something that, that is considered toxic and, and renal toxic or kidney toxic in dogs. Um, So antibiotic cream for dogs um, that you'd recommend for the first aid kit. So like I mentioned, polysporin can be a good one. Polysporin does make a triple, um, triple antibiotic ointment. Um, silver sulfadiazine, you can also, I believe, get over the counter. Um, that's generally a pretty good one. It's not a triple antibiotic, um, but it can be really helpful for wounds. And then um, your veterinarian may be comfortable um, dispensing something that they uh, have themselves, uh, or if you have an antibiotic ointment that you've used on wounds in the past that you've got from your veterinarian. So for the most part, you can't really go wrong with a topical antibiotic. Um, and um, so any of those options would be great. Um, so if you have a deep chested dog, do you recommend proactively having their stomach stitched with a routine spay to prevent future GDB? Um, in a perfect world, absolutely. Especially a spay, you're already up into the abdomen. You're already right in that area. It's really just a matter of extending that incision very slightly cranially, so very slightly more towards the head. Um, Great Danes, 100%. I always recommend that Great Danes have their stomach tacked, male or female. Uh, there's just, they are so um, highly predisposed. And it's such an emergency. And it just, it, while lots of dogs get through it and are perfectly fine, um, there is some level of fatality in these situations and never something we want to deal with if we don't have to. So I would say, um, Yes, if you have one of these deep chested dogs, and, and in particular a Great Dane, I would recommend it. Uh, basically, there's a 100% success rate of um, 
preventing GDB in an, in an appropriately done um, stomach tacking or stomach pexy. So I would always recommend that. Uh, normal temperature for dogs and cats. So typically speaking, uh, uh, dogs and cats, uh, body temperature is a little higher than ours. Um, to be honest, whenever I take my son's temperature, I always have to look up what normal is for human because I, <laughs> I am constantly forgetting. But normal for dogs and cats is typically 38 to 39. I don't get too, too worried at the 39 to 39.5. It's something I might keep an eye on. But once we get over that 39.5, definitely once we're heading into that 40, 40.5, definitely something that, that we should be um, dealing with, something that you should be calling your veterinarian for. Um, and telpa pads on burn wounds. Um, again, like I mentioned earlier, be really careful dealing with burns um, yourself. Um, if it really does appear to be something superficial, I don't have a huge issue with uh, telpa pads on burn wounds. Um, biggest thing, the, the biggest problem that bandages can cause in wounds, um, wounds heal by forming new granulation tissue, so forming new tissue over top of that wound. And every time we pull a bandage off, we risk ripping that new granulation tissue off. So the reason we like this non-stick material is because it won't interrupt that granulation process and slow down the healing. Burns, though, do often require, again, depending on how deep and how severe they are, do often require um, different... Uh, modalities to to get them to heal so unless it's extremely superficial i'd recommend consulting with your veterinarian before applying anything um, at home dog ear infection suggestions that's a tough one um, because ear infections really can comprise so many things from bacterial infections to um, yeast infections, um, to just, um, you know, wax buildup. And so, I mean, even when I see dogs myself in, in practice, we generally are doing cytology, uh, meaning we take a sample from the ear, smear it on a slide and looking at it under the microscope in order to figure out exactly what it is we're dealing with, exactly what uh, organisms are involved in that infection in order to determine the best medication to use. I would say in a pinch, um, you could use something like a Burroughs solution. Um, you can get that at the pharmacy for basically like swimmer's ear. Burroughs solution is an astringent. So when we have a lot of uh, moisture or irritation in the ear, it can help to dry things out. It can't really do too, too much harm. We're not putting an antibiotic that's not warranted in there. We're not putting an antifungal medication that's not in there. Um, and you know potentially creating uh, or or contributing to that resistance that i'm sure everyone has heard about in terms of antibiotic resistance but i don't think you can go wrong for a couple of days with bro solution um but otherwise again probably something to consult your veterinarian about unfortunately oh suggestions for seasonal allergies in dogs well that's a that's a whole presentation in and of itself um Again, it depends on the severity of the seasonal allergies um, in your dog. So uh, typically dogs that are experiencing seasonal allergies are itchy, um, licking, scratching, chewing their feet. Um, that's, that's kind of the typical things that you see. Um, some simple things to try if you really do feel quite convinced that it is a seasonal allergy. Uh, when your dog comes in from outside, you can take a damp cloth wipe down their legs, feet, lower belly, anywhere that's more likely to have come into contact with some of those allergens, um, pollens, grasses, things like that. Sometimes just reducing that antigen load each and every time they come um, in from outside can be helpful. Um, the antihistamines have some um, some success in dogs, I would not say to the same degree that is in people. Also, if you know any people that suffer from seasonal allergies, I'm sure that they'll tell you that, you know, they found Claritin worked for them and Reactine didn't or vice versa. And there's obviously multiple drugs on the market. And the same is true for dogs. So it may be a bit of a um, trial and error to see what works for your dogs. I will say generally with antihistamines, we need 
one to two weeks um, in order to see results. So a single dose probably isn't going to help you as much as you're hoping that it will, but you probably don't have any harm in trying something like Benadryl. Again, you can contact your veterinarian um, and, and, uh, and have a dose um, calculated for you. There are some great products out there that can um, help the skin barrier. Um, again, whole other presentation, but seasonal allergies often happen because um, pollens and other allergens can enter into the skin. Um, dogs with um, dogs that suffer from from allergies often have a very loose and open skin barrier, as opposed to dogs that don't, where that skin barrier is nice and tight. Um, simplifying that explanation. So there's lots of products that can be used um, preemptively before the season really gets full into swing to help build up that that um, that skin barrier. Um, my dog actually that's in that picture came to me with horrific allergies and he had virtually no hair on him. Um, he was missing about 75% of his hair. Um, and I've had some great success the last couple of summers starting early in the season, late spring, early summer, um, getting some of these topical sprays and products applied. Um, and they've really helped him in terms of lessening his reactions. Uh, and then obviously there are um, medications that your veterinarian can prescribe um, that are super effective at reducing signs. The big thing with seasonal allergies is, is we want to um, reduce infections that happen when these allergies are allowed to go on unchecked. And so it's really important that we get on them um, sooner rather than later. I, I apologize, that's a very complicated issue with probably too simplified of an answer. Um, unfortunately, digital thermometers in the ear, um, Honestly, I, I've tried um, a couple of my son's thermometers on my dog uh, to see if they work. I can't get the infrared ones to work, even when trying them on a, on a non-haired area like his belly um, and the ear. They just don't seem to be very accurate. Best way to take a temperature uh, is rectally. You can, in a pinch, if, if your animal uh, really won't let you get in there, you can take an uh, auxiliary, so get right into the armpit of your pet really hold that leg down but when you do that you want to add about a degree to that to get a little bit more accuracy uh, first aid course for your pet um i would say i mean there are definitely some some first aid courses out there i would say for the average person it may not be necessary if you're somebody who's really active with your dog does a lot of hiking does a lot of camping like i mentioned especially remotely probably not a bad idea um, you know, we're fortunate to live in an area where there are a lot of veterinary clinics, uh, where there are a lot of emergency clinics that you can get them in for appropriate care. But when you're going to be in those more isolated areas that you can't access care, a first aid course might really come in handy for you, especially, as I said, you're going to be doing things that have the potential for injury, like hiking, running through woods, that kind of thing. Um, so again, normal temperature for dogs and cats, we did touch on. So anything over about 39.5, and I start to get concerned. Uh, what information would you carry with you for a vet if you are vacationing and find yourself in a pet emergency? Um, always know the um, uh, medications that your dog is on. Um, try to keep a list if your pet has ever had a reaction to any medication, um, even if it's something you consider to be mild, I would just keep a note of that so that you can let a new veterinarian know. Um, and uh, obviously any pertinent um, medical history for your pet, so if they've had any major illnesses. And then as I mentioned, when you're going to a new place, I would um, get in the habit of looking up uh, close veterinary clinics that have uh, out of hours times and close emergency clinics. Uh, there's nothing worse than an emergency and trying to find that information quickly and you know losing some much needed time. Is fusidin okay as an antibiotic cream for dogs? That would be a totally fine option. Yeah. And vital signs for dogs and cats. So um, that's a bit of a tough one. Um, you know, obviously monitoring heart rate and respiration and temperature is important, but it's kind of a hard thing to interpret um, in all situations. 
you have to consider respiration rate um, is going to be higher in a dog that's exercised and a dog that's warm because of that need to uh, pant to lower body temperature. Um, in terms of, of heart rates, um, they vary greatly and really vary greatly depending on the size of the dog. Uh, so small dogs are going to have a faster heart rate um, than a large dog. More active dogs are going to have a lower heart rate than a more sedentary dog. I would say for a dog that's at rest um, and has not, um, you know, recently exercised, something over um, something over like 150 is probably going to be concerning and you might want to give them a call. Um, for a cat, probably something over 180 to 200 is something that might be concerning. Um, but it's that's a really hard one to answer because it really does vary so much depending on the situation and depending on the animal. Um, you're right, garlic and onions are things that your um, pets, particularly dogs, shouldn't eat but they do generally need to be in larger amounts. So again, if your dog consumes a couple of bites of your dinner that contains that, probably not something that you need to be um, rushing them in for. If you had an entire meal made that contained garlic and onions and they ate that whole pan, which some dogs will do, something I would call, um, call your veterinarian for. Uh, macadamia nuts and toxicity. Honestly, off the top of my head, I can't remember that one. Um, if I'm remembering correctly, um, they're not as much of a concern as most people think. Um, but I apologize, off the top of my head, I need to look that up. Um, what type of Benadryl should you have on hand? So solid tablets. There is a solid tablet, there is a liquid. Um, depends on the size of the dog. For medium to large breed dogs, tablets are gonna be fine. There's gonna be some combination you can do um, with with a tablet that um, that should work out for you. If you have a really tiny dog, something under like three to four kilos, um, so you know a teacup chihuahua, teacup poodle, something like that, then the liquid might be a little bit more helpful. You can get a little bit more accurate dosing rather than trying to get like a fourth or a sixth of a tablet. So it might be helpful. Uh, but solid tablets generally work pretty well. Um, what I will just remind everybody, be sure that the Benadryl that you're getting, it is purely just Benadryl. So nothing that is like um, cold and sinus, it should have one ingredient in it. And that only ingredient is um, the actual drug called diphenhydramine. There shouldn't be anything else in it. So you do want to be sure that it's just your, your general um, diphenhydramine. Uh, oh, that's a great point. I apologize. And I really should have touched on this pain medication, medication question. So Advil, Tylenol, aspirin, um, great question. Um, Advil, 100% no, never should be given to dogs. It is uh, incredibly toxic to dogs. There are no doses that are appropriate for a dog um, and it is toxic to their kidneys um, and it does create some um, gastrointestinal effects as well. So never okay to give a dog uh, Advil. Um, aspirin, there are published doses of aspirin. I really try to avoid it if at all possible. Um, it can create some gastrointestinal issues. So similar to people that can get um, um, ulcers and things like that. I would say the difference between um, people and dogs is that a person can articulate very easily that, you know, I'm starting to have some stomach pain. I don't feel great after I have aspirin. And, um, and so they can stop taking it. Whereas a dog can't show you that. My other concern with aspirin is it does, if you end up having to take your dog into the veterinarian, it does um, limit some of the other pain medications that I can give, uh, some of the most effective pain medications that I can give. And so it's, it's always really tough when somebody's already given aspirin. Tylenol in dogs in most cases is pretty safe to give. Um, again, you please contact your veterinarian to get an appropriate dose to be able to give to your dog in a pinch if you're somewhere that, that um, you know, you don't have access to another pain medication. In cats, never okay. So um, I would always, before you're giving anything um, to your cat, uh, never give anything human related and, and you should always be calling your veterinarian first. Uh, pet insurance for pet emergencies. Um, 
Again, million dollar question. Um, pet insurance is never a bad idea. Um, is it for everyone? Not necessarily. Uh, but if there's ever going to be uh, hard decisions that have to be made due to finances for pet emergencies, um, thousand percent pet insurance is always going to be um, be a good idea. Um, you have to look at it as you do for any other kind of insurance. Is it always going to pay for itself? No, but when you need it, you're certainly glad that it's there. Um, there's nothing worse than having, um, you know, than as a veterinarian having an, an, uh, an issue that we can fix and we can't fix due to finances um, and never a worse decision to make as a pet owner either. So um, definitely I would say, uh, pet insurance is a good idea. The nice thing is, is there are policies that are in place purely for emergencies um, in terms of purely for wounds, injuries, fractures, that kind of thing, as opposed to just general illness. So, you know, if it's something you're considering, then it might be worth looking into purely in a, uh, an emergency you know. profile. Um, uh, this time of year, tick removal protocol, when to see a vet about a tick. Honestly, most people can probably remove a tick themselves. Um, one thing I will say, please make sure that it is a tick. I do see a lot of people trying to remove skin tags and warts, um, thinking, you know, really feeling sure that it's a tick and it's not. Um, but if you feel very confident that it's a tick, it's generally something most people can, can manage on their own. Gently using tweezers. Um, there are some things uh, like tick twisters and, and tick removers that you can purchase. Uh, again, YouTube is a great source for that um, in terms of learning ways to, to safely remove ticks. Never uh, those old wives tales of uh, cover them in Vaseline, light them on fire, pour gas on them. Those are all very bad ideas and, and actually can increase your, your pet's risk of getting disease from a tick um, also can obviously harm them in terms of things like fire. Um, I think calling your veterinarian if you've removed a tick or you see a tick is a good idea and they'll recommend um, when that you should see them. If your pet is on tick prevention, they probably don't need to come in and be seen because that tick really should not have been on for any period of time to, uh, to transmit any disease. Um, but a call to your veterinarian, they can always recommend when it's seen. But again, tick removal, I think, can be can be managed by most people. Uh, if a cat has a torn nail, do you recommend they see a vet to have it removed? Um, uh, it depends on the severity. Um, it, again, having it evaluated is never a bad idea. Um, sometimes it's just kind of lightly torn. You can stop the bleeding. They never look at it again, and it's not a problem. My concern with cat torn nails uh, sometimes is the litter box. Um, you can't avoid them going into the litter box and especially with clumping litter, it can really attach to that and increase their risk of infection. Um, so depending on severity, yeah, they should probably go in and, and have it dealt with. Um, so again, if your dog or cat brings home a tick attached, we touched on that, something you can probably manage on your own. If you're particularly squeamish, your veterinarian will be happy to, to have them or one of the support staff remove it. Uh, treatment for bug bites, uh, black fly bites, deer or horse fly bites. No, if it's not bothering them, if they're leaving them alone, not necessarily um, anything that needs to be dealt with. Um, dogs have a pretty unique reaction to black fly bites. Um, they actually get what looks like that target lesion that you hear about in ticks. Um, but they're usually flat on the skin. They don't bother the dogs at all. So not necessarily anything that needs to be dealt with. I often just have people send me a picture. I identify it as a, as a black fly bite and just tell them to watch them. If you find they're really itchy, that's a spot where um, uh, an antihistamine like Benadryl might come in handy. But I honestly find most um, most dogs deal with these perfectly fine. Oh gosh, uh, what would you do if your dog gets bitten by a rattlesnake? Unfortunately, I have to reach back really far to vet school to answer that one because we just don't have any um, rattlesnakes of any concern in this area. Um, if I remember correctly, there is a, an antivenom that they need to get, but off the top of my head, I'm so sorry because we just don't see that in our area. It's not something I generally deal with. Uh, for cats that are fearful, aggressive at the vet, what do you recommend to make the process easier for everyone? Oh, that's a great question because everyone is right. It's very, cats are generally fearful and aggressive, like generally aggressive at the veterinary. 
purely out of terror. You have to imagine these indoor cats who stay in their house 364 days of the year, and then they come out to this strange place where all of these strangers are touching them. It's a really stressful time. There's a really wonderful drug called gabapentin that um, your veterinarian can prescribe. It's very safe. There's virtually no contraindications, meaning even if your cat is suffering from kidney disease or liver disease or anything like that, it's very safe for them to take. They often don't get very sedated, but it makes them just very comfortable and happy. And I have cats that are untouchable and they get some gabapentin and come in and I can do a full exam, get blood samples, vaccinate, do everything I need to do. So it's really helpful. I really love it for these fearful cats because I, I feel awful for them when they're there and so stressed. And this can just make their whole experience so much more um, so much more enjoyable for everybody. Um, so definitely contact your vet about using gabapentin. And pellet litter, safer, safer than clumping litter. There's nothing unsafe about clumping litter. I don't have a problem with it. I honestly think it's it's human and cat um, human and cat uh, dependent. So it litter just needs to be something that your cat is very comfortable using, and um, and something that you know you can live with and deal with. Um, so. I do recommend always unscented litter. That's the only thing I will say. Um, any of these clumping litters that are baby powder scented or whatever they are, stay away from those. Um, and anything that you can use that's lower dust, um, I would recommend just for respiratory issues, but um, I wouldn't say either is safer, it's just preference. Gabapentin works beautifully for nail clipping, absolutely. And dogs that need their anal glands expressed due to needing more fiber in their diet. Is it safe to sprinkle Metamucil on their food? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Metamucil is, is fine. You can kind of titrate it to a dose that, um, that seems to help them um, without bulking their stool up so much that it's prohibitive. But Metamucil is pretty safe. Um, brand Buds, the cereal Brand Buds is also pretty safe. You can just um, sprinkle some of that on there. Um, so no harm in using that at all. And I think we have come to the end of our questions. Dr. Baird, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. I'm sure that we all have some great takeaways for certain, and you have certainly done your job making sure that we as pet owners are enriching our pets' lives and ensuring that they live longer for sure. And obviously we hope that we don't have any emergencies, but uh, we know that when we need to seek medical <coughs> attention, um, we now have some knowledge around uh, when that's appropriate and when we should be doing it. So thank you for taking the time out today um, to answer all of our questions and uh, provide us with lots of information that we will be able to use to better the lives of our pets. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me and thanks everyone who attended. And I hope you, um, I hope everybody learned a little something and uh, feels a little bit pre better prepared for some of those emergency situations. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate you attending and supporting the Oakville Milton Humane Society. Please stay in touch. We do plan to have more seminars on a variety of topics. So thank you very much. Have a safe and wonderful evening. Have a great night.